Okay, welcome everyone to our Sunday morning service, and uh, welcome everyone who's watching online. We're going to be in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, that's where we're going to begin. Hebrews chapter 6, if you want to follow along with your Bibles. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to actually uh, begin in uh, verse 7. I'll give you all a second to get there. Hebrews 6, verse 7, written by the Apostle Paul, says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that comes often upon it, and brings forth herbs, meat for those by whom it is dressed, receives blessing from God. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Amen. In verses 7 and 8, Paul speaks of this rain that comes upon the earth. And it speaks of how the earth brings forth herbs, which is fruit. It bears fruit. And that, that is meat. That means befitting. It is proper. Meat that is, be, or, uh, that is befitting. And it, it also speaks as well as thorns and briars. That some parts of the earth produce nothing but thorns and briars, while some produces fruit that is befitting. And we're going to talk about this rain and what that is and what the earth is, represents here, and uh, the fruit that is befitting. I call this message, Bearing Fruit That Is Befitting. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray today, Lord. I pray that this message reach the hearts of those who hear, including those online that are listening, Lord. I pray that you are exalted here today, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you speak through me. Lord Jesus, preach through me and teach through me. Hallelujah. Take control of this service, I pray, Lord. That you are the head of the church, Lord Jesus. And that you have complete control today. And Lord, I surrender myself to you. Hallelujah. And I pray that you anoint them that they may hear. And I ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. I want to do uh, Hebrews 6. Uh, in verse 7, Paul uses the physical to describe the spiritual. It's what he's doing here. And so, and he often does that. Verse 7 says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that comes often upon it. Now this is not the former rain. This is not the latter rain. It's just rain. <laughs> but it's a special kind of rain because the earth, what is the earth that the rain falls upon? As every born again believer, you are the earth in this. Every born again believer, and the rain is the infallible word of God. And the word of God is poured out on everyone. It says, For the earth, that's the born again believer, which drinks in, means to consume or takes in the rain, the word of God. That comes often upon it. That's important, isn't it? The Word of God should come often upon you. We should be in the Word of God every day, studying the Word of God. Amen? We should always, that's how we get our spiritual food, the Word of God. What did Jesus say? He repeated the words of Deuteronomy 8 and 3 when he was being tempted by the devil in the wilderness that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. That is the word of God. And it says, and brings forth herbs, which is fruit. Fruit befitting. Talk about fruit. Are we bearing fruit? 
We bring it into the Word of God. We consume the Word of God. It comes down like rain upon us, and we soak it up. We should, if we are properly understanding the Word of God, that's why I say Bible study is important, that we understand the Word of God. We can bear that fruit that's befitting. In Mark 11, Jesus looks afar so off and sees a fig tree. Remember that? Mm -hmm. This is not a parable. This is a true story shared in the book of Mark. I believe Matthew also shared it. He looks so far off and he sees a fig tree. And Jesus begins to cross, walk across the field towards that fig tree because he thinks he sees it bearing figs, it bearing fruit. Even though the Word of God tells us it was not the time for the figs. So why is he walking over there? Because he sees fruit. But what happens when he gets there? Nothing but leaves. And what does Jesus do? He curses the fig tree. The next day, of course, they, they come by there and Peter says, Look, that tree that you cursed, it's withered and died. See, this fig tree was symbolic of Israel. Israel was not producing the fruit that God had called them to do. They were not producing fruit. The, and the fact that Jesus looked afar off and seen figs, what he thought were figs, when he got there with nothing but leaves, speaks of deception. Israel was producing deception. They had all the appearances of producing fruit as the Pharisees would stand out in the streets and praise God and, and pray in front of everyone and they'd say, oh, look at these men of God. And they would do things to make sure that everyone's seen. So what the appearance was that they were producing fruit. They were living for God, but it was deceiving. This is why Jesus came. Israel was not doing what God had called them to do. What about Christians today? Are we just a fig tree full of leaves? Are we producing the fruit that we should be producing? Are we into the Word of God often like we should be? We're never going to produce fruit unless we cultivate the Word of God into our hearts. Amen. It said, It brings forth herbs, which is fruit, befitting for those by whom it is dressed. Whom is this fruit dressed for? The kingdom. The kingdom of God. Hallelujah. That's you. If you're born again believer, you are in the kingdom of God. And we should be bearing fruit. And receive blessing from God. Every believer that's walking with God, that is in Christ Jesus, as Paul would put it, you died with Christ at Calvary. You went into the tomb. You've been resurrected in newness of life. Now walk therein, Paul would say. We should be walking in blessings. We should be blessed by God. Hallelujah. All blessings come from the throne of God. You understand that God the Father only blesses one, and that's His Son, Jesus. And if you are in Christ Jesus, you are a benefactor of the blessing that He pours out onto His Son. Amen. The verse, verse 8 says, But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected. See, the field, the earth that receives, that produces, that bears thorns and briars, also receives the rain. I mean, let's understand. The rain falls on your yard just as much as it does your neighbor's yard, right? You ever see, some people's lawn looks like a, a golf course, while others looks like crapola. <laughs> For lack of a better, it looks terrible. <laughs> it's both. Full of weeds and they don't seem to tend it, they don't care about it. So the rain falls on both, and it falls on those that produce that bears thorns and briars, and God rejects it. Because their works that they're doing, these people are not doing the works of God. They're not doing them properly. Because there's something amiss. And uh and 
1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul describes people in the church that bear such thorns and briars. Yeah, they're, they're in the church. And people that believe they are, these are people that believe they are living for God. They believe that they're living for God, but their fruit appears to be thorns and briars. And is rejected by God. And they're living for God without conviction. They can't discern the difference. That they're not producing fruit. They even go to the point of thinking that their worldly gain is godliness. They think that they make this connection that everything that they're all their possessions means that they're a godly person. So that's the evidence they're a godly person. And the error of their ways because of false doctrine. They've been indoctrinated wrong, they believe wrong. In first Timothy said, Paul says if any man teach otherwise. I Meaning Paul saying that if you're listening to someone, or if you're teaching someone, anything other than what I am telling you, which is Jesus Christ and Him crucified, it's the gospel. It says, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ is the word of God. And to the doctrine which is according to godliness. What is godliness? What is godliness? Godliness is defined as having a proper attitude towards God. To be like-minded with God. To believe correctly. Godliness. But this person, he is proud. He's proud of what he has and his accomplishments. Knowing nothing. Contrary to what he says, he knows nothing but going about questions and strifes of words, meaning that they are they have an unhealthy craving for controversy. They often cause friction in the church and for quarrels about words. They want to argue over doctrine. They want to argue over what they think is right and what perhaps you believe is right. They want to argue over the word of God. They may argue. They Paul dealt with this. Paul had to deal with people uh, concerning the words he used when he preached. They didn't like it. Mostly the Judaizers. And they would quarrel with Paul about this. It says, where comes envy, strife, railings, and evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth. Because they don't know the truth. That's why they want to argue constantly. And they produce nothing but thorns and briars. They're not capable of producing fruit. Supposing that gain is godliness. They believe that their gain, everything that they own, their money and such is godliness. From which, he tells Timothy, from which withdraw thyself. Get away from these people, he says. Supposing that gain is godliness. But godliness, Paul says. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Be content with what God has given you. Hallelujah. He says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So many people today, and sadly amongst Christians, and they often, what I call the greed gospel, and those that pursue of riches continually. You can't take it with you when you go, folks. <laughs> we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, which is clothing, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. To be content with what God has provided you. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, because their eyes are always on the world and not God. The pursuit of riches. It reminds me of the story Jesus told of the rich man and Lazarus. 
Are we all familiar with the story of the rich man and Lazarus? It says, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously, if I can say that word correctly, uh, sumptuously every day. So this rich man that Jesus is talking about, understand, this is not a parable. This is a true story told by the Lord Jesus Christ because he uses Lazarus' name. He mentions a name. Whenever Jesus told parables, he never mentioned names. They were just a parable. He says, this, this rich man, he had the best clothes. He lived in a mansion, what we would call a mansion today, a beautiful home. And he was very rich. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. So this man, he's very well to do, this rich man. He has a home that has a gate in front of it. It's a gated uh, for his protection or what so have you. And so Lazarus was a beggar, laid at the gate, and he was full of sores. And he begged. And he begged for food. And, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So you've got a rich man that I tell you he's constantly probably putting on banquets and feeding all his friends and, and blessing them and, and enjoying his riches while a beggar. Lazarus lays at the gate waiting for the crumbs to fall off the table to be fed. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So Abraham, excuse me, so Lazarus, he dies from his condition and He's carried off by the angels to Abraham to be comforted. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So he dies and is buried, and the next thing he knows, he lifts, opens his eyes, and he's in hell. And he's in torment. Not because he was rich. Okay? It's what he did with his riches. And he cared, and he cried, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. So now we see Lazarus is going to be with Abraham in paradise while the rich man is on the other side of the gulf. He can see Abraham, he's on the other side of the gulf, and he is uh, tormented in these flames. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. You got your reward on earth. All the riches that you had that you pursued. While Lazarus laid at your gate and suffered and died, you were chasing the riches of the world and enjoying yourself. And he says, and likewise, Lazarus received evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Kind of turns the tables, doesn't it? This rich man had everything he wanted in life. But he lacked one thing, really. He had love. Jesus said, don't even the pagans love one another, one another, right? He had love. He had love for his possessions, love for his money, love for all the wrong things. He lacked the two greatest commandments, love the Lord thy God 
with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. The first and greatest commandment. He thought he did love God. He thought that he was a godly man because he was so rich. He thought he was doing all the right things. And he looked at Lazarus like, you poor beggar, you're full of sin. You've got sin in your life. That's why God's not blessing you. The rich man didn't realize he was being tested to help this poor man. And he, he lacked the second commandment, which is what? Love thy neighbor as thyself. He did not love his neighbor, Lazarus. He did not care about Lazarus. That's why he was in love with himself. Think about it. Going back to 1 Timothy 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money, the love of money is the root of all evil. That's one of the most verses in the Bible that's misquoted. Some people say, well, if money's so evil, why is the church passing around the offering plate? How come they, they want to you know, make an offering? If, if, no, money's not evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money. And that's what the rich man was doing. He was in love with his money and pursuing after worldly things. And uh, love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's all the world can do. That's all the world has for you is sorrow. Everything's temporal. But God has eternal life for you. God has joy unspeakable and full of glory is what he wants to give you. Amen? And they, the world brings nothing but sorrow. But you, O oh man of God, but you, O oh man of God, flee these things he's telling Timothy. Flee from these things. Don't fall into the snare of the love of money. And follow after what? Righteousness. Follow after the righteousness of God and godliness and have faith. Follow after faith. Faith in what Jesus did. Hallelujah. That you, He cleansed you of your sins. He died for your sins. It says follow after love. Love is the bond of perfectness. Jesus is perfectness. He is, the, he is perfect. He did the perfect sacrifice. The greatest love hath no man known except he laid on his life for his friends. And patience, it says, and meekness. Meekness means being submissive to the will of God. And not your own will. And Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. That is the only fight that we should be fighting. The good fight of faith. What I mean, what I mean by that is, so often Christians are snared up in fighting the devil. Or they're, they're fighting against sin. And it's a constant battle with sin. Sin was defeated. The devil was defeated at Calvary. Okay? You just need to get into Christ Jesus. You need to fill up on Jesus and stop filling up on the world. You've got to empty yourself of the worldly things. That's what riches will do to you. Jesus said what? Well, he said it's more difficult for a rich man to get into heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. He didn't say it was impossible for a rich man to get into heaven, but it's really difficult because the lures of the, of the world are constantly pulling at, pulling at you and pulling you away from God. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Take hold of eternal life. Whereto you are also called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. That's the moment you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you professed it to many witnesses. That Jesus was the king of your heart. Amen. Praise be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And Jesus would say in John 15, He says, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The word of God. The word of God. You are clean by the words that Jesus said, I have spoken unto you. Jesus is the word. John 1.1. 1, 1. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is the living Word. And so these words have made you clean. It says, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. A branch cannot bear fruit unless it's attached to the vine, correct? Other than that, it will wither and die. And so Jesus says, abide in me, because Jesus says that he is the vine, and you are the branches. So, he's saying, the fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. You cannot bear fruit unless you abide in Jesus Christ. Makes sense? But what is this fruit? We talk about thorns and briars. God rejects all that. Has no use for it. What good are thorns and briars? Useless, right? Pretty much. I ain't got no use for them. People that produce thorns and briars are not producing fruit for the kingdom. What is the fruit? There's really only one, and it's singular. Not fruits. There's not fruits of the Spirit. There's fruit of the Spirit. So what is the fruit? The fruit that we should all be producing is souls for Christ. We should be bringing people into the kingdom. We should be harvesting the souls. We should be out there bringing people to God, reconciling people to God. That's producing fruit. That's the fruit that God wants. The harvest of souls. He wants to harvest fruit. Reconcile people unto God. I tell you, the church is in terrible shape these days. They've been in terrible shape for a long time. There's churches that I preached against riches right here. There are preachers that are going to stand up here and preach about being millionaires and billionaires. It's not scriptural what they're saying. Nothing wrong with money. It's what you do with it. Am I giving to the kingdom? See, that's another way of producing fruit. If you producing fruit is giving to the work of God that will eventually bring souls to Christ. The Christ Community Center over here that we're building. The hope is to bring souls to Christ. To give people the word of God. Help people rebuild their lives founded on the cross of Jesus Christ. The preaching of the gospel produces fruit. When we do the works of God that can potentially bring people to Christ, that's the kind of fruit God wants. Fit for the kingdom. Like the apostle Paul said, lay hold on eternal life. In other words, lay hold on the vine because Jesus, life, Jesus Christ is that eternal life. That's where it comes from. Lay hold on Jesus. Take a hold of him. Back to Hebrews 6. It says, but that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto be cursed, whose end is to be burned. So their works are nothing but thorns and briars. This really speaks of the judgment seat of Christ. In the end, when their works are judged, their works are burned up. I pray that when I get to heaven and I stand before the throne of God and he puts my works to the fire test that it's refined like gold and silver and brass that it does not burn up. Praise God. Because it was done with godliness in the right mindset. I didn't do it for me. I did it because I love God. Hallelujah. Paul goes on to say, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. Paul says, I know you can do better. You're better than briars and thorns. You're capable of producing that fruit that God desires. You can do better, Paul says, and things that accompany salvation. 
What accompanies salvation? When you got saved, you were given something. The promises of God. You were exempt from the promises of God before you got saved, but now the, all the promises that are in the Bible is for you. Amen. Praise God. Read about them. The Bible's full of the promises of God. Though thus we speak, Paul says. He's basically saying, I'm speaking from experience, Paul says. I know what I'm talking about. Verse 10 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Key word right there. Labor of love. Of love. That you do this because you love God. You're out there being a soldier for Christ. When you walk out of here, you're, you're not a different person when you walk out of here. You're still a godly person that loves God and you want to reconcile people unto God. You want to bear fruit. And God will not forget your work and labor of love which he has shown toward his name. That's important. That you have shown towards his name. That you did it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Not for yourself. You weren't doing these works and standing out here with a selfie stick saying, look everybody. <laughs> and taking pictures as you're handing somebody, helping somebody out. That's not how it's done. You're not saying, look at me. You did it in the name of Jesus Christ. The name above all names. There's power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. This is speaking of ministers, those who preach the gospel, but it's also speaking of every one of us that minister to the saints. I know some of you might be thinking, how do I, how am I going to minister to anyone? I'm not, I, I can't get up there behind the pole. I'm not asking to get up here behind the pole. But, but we can minister to our family members, our friends, our co-workers, everyone we meet. In Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, ye are the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. That's you. The light of the world. Let your light shine. He says, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Put on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. That's what we should be. Every one of us. I said this last Sunday. I believe I closed with the same thing. We have the lights of the world. Our light should not be hidden. That light that we have is a and we are is from God. And because we are born again, we are a house of the Holy Ghost. God, the Spirit of God dwells in us, and He His light shines out. And it should, it shouldn't be it. That's how we minister. That's how we are, because we are lights of the world, Jesus said. The final verse here. Let your light so shine before men. That they may see your good works. And once again, like I said last Sunday, <coughs> that they see your good works, the results of your good works. Not so much seeing you doing the good works. And there's nothing wrong if they see you doing the good works, okay? People can drive by and see that we're doing some good work over here, okay? putting this building up a Christ community center to help people and people are going to come in and they're going to see us doing good works that's fine but we're doing it in the name of Jesus because we love Jesus who bled and died for you he paid the ransom for your sin do you know what I think about Jesus died on the cross and Oh, my sin did that. He was crucified. He bled and died. He suffered. And no sin. He committed no sins. He done no wrong. But he took my wrong upon himself. Every one of us. There ain't no sinner he can't save, the song says. Amen. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let your light so 
shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Thank you, yes, please. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's why you do it. You don't take the glory for it. God can solve the glory and praise his name. That the world can see that and give glory to God. That's how we minister, doing the good works. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. We got to bear fruit, folks. We got to start bearing fruit. The clock's ticking, the clock's running out in this world. It's two minutes till midnight, I'm telling you. We're almost there. The return of the Lord. And I can't wait for that glorious day when the sky opens up and He comes down. In all His glory. Hallelujah. The King of kings and Lord of lords. Every one of us have family members that are not saved. Every one of us have friends that don't know who Jesus is. What are we waiting for, folks? Why are, we, why, are, why are we not ministering to them? Oh, they don't want to hear it, Pastor. You put that before the Lord, okay? The Lord knows that they don't want to hear it. But the Lord will create an opportune time and bring something to fruition in their life where well, they'll want to hear it. If your heart is truly seeking Him, God will create that situation. That day will come when they'll want to hear it, and you've got to be ready to give it to them. I don't want to see my family members go to hell. Neither do any of you. I don't want to see my friends going to hell. Time's running out. We've got to produce that fruit that's befitting for the kingdom. We've got to stay on course. We've got to fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Amen. We've got to keep moving forward. Running that race. And tearing off those, losing all those weights that's called sin that holds us back. Let those things go. Giving those things to God. Say, God, take away these things that are not of you. These weights that are holding me down. Jesus said, if any man put his hand to the plow, if any man that put his hand to the plow and looks back, it's not fit for the kingdom. we got to keep moving the plow forward, cultivating the word of God into our lives. Amen. Praise God. We can't look back. You don't believe me? Yes, Lot's wife. She looked back. She became a pillar of salt. When we look back, it's nothing but destruction. We live lives of destruction, but now we're living for the kingdom. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I pray today, Lord, that we would bear fruit. Lord, fruit that's befitting, not deception, not thorns or briars. Lord, that we would take the kingdom to all the world. Lord, to take this gospel, the good news that someone paid my price, someone paid the price for my sin. The ransom's been paid. God demanded. The thrice holy God demanded it. And innocent man would die. The Lamb of God, he would send his only son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Thank you, Jesus. I pray today as we go out of here that your spirit go with every one of us and speak to us that we not quench your spirit. We allow your spirit. We not pursue the riches of the world, but pursue lost souls. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. I thank you. I love you, Lord. We love you and we thank you and praise you for shedding your blood that all men may be saved. And we ask in Jesus' mighty name and all the saints said, Amen. Amen. Amen.